On behalf of the Southeast New England Program Network, welcome to our webinar on a residential guide to stormwater brought to you by the Providence Stormwater Innovation Center. My name is Leah Soloway from the New England Environmental Finance Center, and I'll be assisting with logistics for today's program, along with assistance from the media team at the University of Southern Maine. A little background about the SNP Network before we get started. Um, the SNP Network's mission is to empower communities to achieve healthy watersheds, sustainable financing, and long-term climate resilience through the management of stormwater and restoration projects. We focus on building local capacity by providing no-cost trainings, webinars, and technical assistance to communities in the SNEP region. If you want to learn more, please visit snepnetwork.org for more information. And before we get into the webinar, there are a few logistics to keep in mind. First, everyone will be on mute to ensure audio quality. You'll be able to ask questions by typing them into the question and answer box in the Zoom control panel at the bottom of your screen. We look forward to answering questions, so please type them in at any time. And um, on that note, we'll get things started, but before we do, we're gonna hand things over to Delia, our translator for today, and she can explain um, the services that she has available. Thanks, Delia, for being here. Thank you, Leah. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Delia Rodríguez Majuan y voy a estar interpretando esta tarde este taller de cómo preservar el agua para poder eh, tener, eh, crear espacios eh, verdes alrededor de nuestras viviendas y proteger el agua. Para tener intérpretes, en la parte de abajo tiene, van a tener un botón, apenas yo me ponga de intérprete, y en ese botón dice Interpretation. Usted presiona ese botón y te da opción para entrar al canal de español. Y una vez que entres en el canal de español me vas a escuchar. Nadie va a poder hablar conmigo, así que si ustedes quieren hacer preguntas, lo tienen que escribir donde dice Q&A, Q-I-A. Y ahí escriben las preguntas y de ahí podemos traducirlas al español. Así que yo me voy sí, ahora al canal de español. Si usted quiere um, eh, recibir esta información en español, apriete el botón de Interpretation y ahí me van a escuchar en español. Ok, I'm going now to the Spanish. Okay, uh, thank you, Delia and Leah, and also thank you to Zach uh, for all of your help with technical assistance and promoting this workshop. Uh, my name is Ryan Kopp. I'm a coordinator at the Providence Stormwater Innovation Center, which is based in Providence's Roger Williams Park, where the city has installed over 40 green stormwater practices that uh, will reduce the amount of pollutants uh, that run off into the ponds and eventually into Narragansett Bay. And so a big part of our mission at the Innovation Center is to provide education to the community uh, about stormwater and green infrastructure through uh, different volunteer monitoring programs, neighborhood outreach programs, uh, signage and exhibits within the park, we do a festival and also workshops like this one. So thanks everybody for attending today's workshop. Uh, the title of today's workshop is The Residential Guide to Stormwater. And without further ado, uh, let me introduce our great presenters that we have uh, tonight. We have Leanne Freitas. She's the Botanical Center Director for the Providence Parks Department. Amelia Rose, she is the Executive Director of Groundwork Rhode Island. Steve Ricci, the Director of Field Operations with Groundwork Rhode Island. Jake Gorky, he's a ranger with the Wanaskatucket River Watershed Council. Sarah Canwell, she's the education director with the Wanaskatucket River Watershed Council. And our interpreter and cultural promo promoter for tonight's event is Delia Rodriguez Maswan. So if you want to know more about uh, uh, all of the presenters, we do have a more detailed bios page uh, at this URL up here on, the, on this slide. So you can go to the website to find out more about them. So if we can, uh, Zach, if you can pull up our quick poll that we're going to have to start off the, the workshop tonight. And we'll leave this up. Uh, it's in English and Spanish. Uh, if you can take the time to fill this out, it gives us a little bit of, of information about all of you in attendance and sort of your current level of knowledge about the subject matter. And there's no right or wrong answer. And this gives us some good information. Okay, uh, we can probably stop that. 
Do you have the results for that, Zach, or is that not real time, maybe? There we go. Okay, so a good, good mix. Um, got some, a, lot of, a lot of people that have a good understanding and some with, with not much, but that's hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a little more, a little more knowledge and information. Okay, so we're gonna uh, start off the presentation tonight with a short video just to get everybody on the same page. It's a three minute video by Stephanie Yin. She's the creator of the video. Uh, just to give everybody uh, this foundation of what is stormwater and uh, what green infrastructure. How's that? Is that better? This is the water cycle. When it rains, sleets, snows, or hails, water goes in one of two directions to end back in ponds, lakes, and oceans. Either it soaks into the ground where it gets filtered, or it runs over the ground's surface. Imagine pouring water into a pitcher with a filter. As you pour, the water seeps through the filter and fills up the pitcher before spilling over. In a forester field, rain soaks into the ground, is filtered by the soil, and nourishes the plants and wildlife. Now, imagine that pitcher has its lid on. When you try to pour water into it, the water runs off the lid without ever getting filtered, spilling onto the floor immediately. This is what happens when it rains in our city. Instead of soaking into the earth, water flows directly over roofs, roads, sidewalks, and parking lots. Along the way, it picks up road salts, sand, pesticides, oil, grease, animal waste, and garbage, then swirls into the nearest storm drain and gushes into rivers and streams that lead to Narragansett Bay. Just over the summer of 2013, polluted stormwater runoff contributed to 119 beach closures across Rhode Island. In the city of Providence, pavement and buildings cover almost 60% of the ground. Stormwater runoff floods streets and basements and pollutes rivers that run into the bay, as well as smaller water bodies like Mashapog Pond and the Roger Williams Park Ponds. To reduce the flooding and pollution from stormwater runoff, we need to improve our drainage system, or infrastructure. Right now, the city mostly uses gray infrastructure, meaning street drains, catch basins, and 400 miles of underground pipes to channel untreated stormwater directly into our water bodies. How can we better manage our stormwater to prevent flooding and pollution? We can imitate the natural water cycle through green infrastructure, using plants, soils, and natural processes to clean and make good use of the rain. Roofs covered with plants, for instance, can capture rain that would normally run off buildings onto streets and sidewalks. These green roofs both absorb the rain and provide helpful insulation, cooling buildings in summer and heating them in winter. Rain gardens capture water so it soaks into the soil and gets used by native plants. In place of curbs and gutters, rain gardens along gently sloped ditches can channel and treat polluted runoff from parking lots and roads. And green roofs and green gardens are only a couple examples of green infrastructure. Green infrastructure projects beautify our communities and protect the natural ecosystems around us. Over their lifetime, they can raise property values and save drainage infrastructure costs. Okay. Uh, well, I think we're going to get right to Leanne and her presentation now. And after her presentation, we will do a, a short 10 minute uh, question and answer for all, any questions that you have uh, either about that video or about her presentation. So go ahead and take it away, Leanne. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, can you see my screen? I just wanna make sure everyone can see that okay. Yep, you're good. Great. Um, so I am going to start my slideshow. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It's very exciting to have you all participate in Stormwater and have that interest. Um, my name is Leanne. I am the director of the Roger Williams Park Botanical Center located right here in Roger Williams Park. 
we are um, hoping that this evening you will learn to create your very own backyard nature preserve in five easy steps. How easy is that, right? We're hoping that um, the 40% of you who said you were um, aware of or had some interest in gardening will easily decipher all of the things that we talk about tonight and do them in your own backyard. So what do I mean by eco gardening? Eco gardening is working within the system that you're given, working within the ecology of the landscape. So in gardening with the ecosystem, what you are doing is not necessarily working to eradicate things from your ecosystem, but rather balance out your ecosystem. So an example of that would be weeds. I am a horticulturist. My first thing to do is look in the garden and go, ah, look at all the weeds, I need to get rid of the weeds. Instead, could we pause in that moment and say, are the weeds a symptom of an imbalanced ecosystem in my yard? And what can I do to balance that out? So some of the things that you might be able to do, um, plant some natives where the birds would eat the seeds of the natives and then disperse those seeds throughout your garden, hopefully overshadowing and outcompeting the weed species in your yard, right? That's one way of maybe looking at your yard in more of a balance rather than let me get rid of something. Eco gardening is also thinking about your garden in a way that you want to improve your landscape. You're not just thinking about, oh, I want plants that are gonna be beautiful and pink or purple. If you're going to the nursery to purchase some new plants or um, plants for your containers, you're thinking about what those plants are going to do in the ecosystem. Are they going to attract some hummingbirds, perhaps butterflies? Maybe you're thinking about pollinators. Even more so, are our plants going to help the broader ecosystem? meaning the soil functioning, the nutrient cycling, right? We're just talking about um, rainwater and the nutrients in rainwater, how that goes to our groundwater. Our soil microorganisms are so important to help us filter out some of those nutrients to absorb and release those for plants. Are we caring for that component of the ecosystem as well? So an eco gardener is someone who, yes, they're interested in plants, yes, they're great, to have for gardens, but they're also interested in supporting the natural environment around them. I love this graph because I think it shows, or, or this picture graphic um, of a gardener within an ecosystem, right? This gardener is part of the surroundings that they're in. They're not separate from, they're not on top of. This gardener has an acute awareness. If this butterfly were to disappear, this gardener would know right away, the butterfly is gone, how does that impact my ecosystem? This gardener also has a better connection to its surroundings. If the butterfly disappeared, again, they would notice that fairly quickly, right? If the giraffe, let's say it's the giraffe that you have in your garden, maybe you live in, in that type of environment, you would know fairly quickly if that giraffe was um, having an increase in population or no longer there, right? So it's having that awareness. This is a picture of what I like to call an ecosystem approach gardener. This gardener is at the top of the ecosystem, right? This gardener is in charge. There's a real disconnect between what's happening with the gardener and what's happening with the animals below. This gardener has no clue what's going on with the lizard or the turtle way down at the bottom of this triangle. This is a gardener who wants to maintain a controlled ecosystem, maintain a garden that looks perfect and really great and doesn't necessarily select plants that are for the bigger picture for the ecosystem, but rather for what they find to be beautiful. It's not necessarily a bad way to garden. We all do it. I'm a horticulturist. That's what I love to do. I love plants. I love to collect plants. But I also need to be mindful of what those plants do in the ecosystem. So this type of gardener has a less understanding of what's going on with the system as a whole. So how does that translate in gardens, right? We've got two pictures here, one on the left and one on the right. The one on the left is what I would consider to be more of an ecosystem gardener. Can you see my pointer? We've got a little bit of um, an ego kind of approach here. There's a house at the top. We've got all this very lush, green, dense lawn, not a weed in sight. We have no flowers for pollinators. 
We have no shrubs where there would be a kind of a thicket for birds to have a habitat in to create a nest in to find some protection. We do have a couple of trees or three trees here, right? So some birds might be able to go up top here. But if we look at the tree over here, if you were an insect that needed to overwinter like a mason bee in the soil, if, where would you go to in this ground? This looks so dense, it would be almost impossible to penetrate, right? So this kind of gardening, this kind of landscape isn't really one that's working within the ecosystem. It's working to suit the homeowner. It's working to suit the gardener. So it's more of an egocentric style landscape versus the one on the right. If you look at this one, you can see that this house kind of sits within the landscape. It's not something separate and isolated. It has a lot of plants around it. So there's lots of flowers. That's important for our pollinators, but also our beneficial insects. It's got a bird feeder here, right? But I'm gonna guarantee that these flowers are probably really great seeds for winter birds. There is a shrub here, there's quite a few. So if there was a bird that required nesting in more of a thicket type area, it would have the capacity to do that. We've got an upper story tree here. So that kind of adds protection as well for birds that will, um, you know, once tiny birds fledge, they flock up into the tree. Birds often sit in trees overnight. So there's a place for the birds to go. We do still have some lawn here, right? But it's not this vast lawn of dense, thick grass. We've got lots of plants. We even have some soil. So if you did need to overwinter in the soil, if you were that mason bee, you've got a spot to go. That looks much more inviting than this very dense grass does. So when we talk about ecosystems, what do we mean? Ecosystems are components of um, connected inputs and outputs within a system between living and non-living things. So each component has a really important role or niche. Each one of the organisms in, in this picture do something very important. If we look at the, the black cap chickadee here, sitting on this oak tree, which is definitely a wonderful species of tree, there's lots of things here for this bird to eat. We've got a little lady beetle here. More importantly, we've got an earthworm over here. We've got some snails. They definitely prefer the soft-bodied insects, right? Much easier to eat. There are spiders. They will occasionally eat spiders. There's a snail. Once this chickadee eats one of these things, he's inputting into his own system. And then he outputs by going, digesting the insect and going to the bathroom, right? He leaves scat behind. That scat becomes food for perhaps this little guy or the earthworm. Perhaps the snail will come and digest that. Each time we go through digestion, we are leaving behind nutrients. This tree cannot absorb those nutrients unless one of these organisms digests it. So each time we have this system here of input, we input with the frass, we output by eating, right? Each time we do this, we are nutrient cycling. So the ecosystem is really important. Each one of those organisms had a very important role in their niche. What happens if we remove a component of the ecosystem? This is a great example. And I think if any of you live in any sort of area where you have deer, you know this example all too well. So on the left, we have an ecosystem that's functioning very well. We have top of the line predators, this bear. We have a lot of small plant diversity and large plant diversity. We have medium size and smaller size predators. And we have large herbivores and smaller herbivores. Now, what happens if we move, remove a part of this ecosystem? Let's take out the brown bear and look at the picture on the right. The large predator is now absent. Now we have a fluctuation in our large herbivore population. What do they do? They graze more on these smaller plants because they're delicious. You can't blame them. Now, not having these plants leaves less plants available for our smaller songbirds and migratory birds. There's less for them to eat. They're no longer part of this ecosystem. Removing one part has, one part of the ecosystem has a compound effect. It impacts the entire ecosystem. 
then ecosystems need to be balanced in order to work efficiently because they provide us services. Imbalanced ecosystems create an imbalance in the services. What are some of those services? Clean water, that's one of the reasons why we're all here, right? Balanced ecosystems help us purify the air. They are really important in soil fertility and nutrient cycling. Of course, for pollination, pest control, not all, um, you know, we rely on flowers for pollination, but lots of beneficial insects like tiny wasps rely on the nectar in flower, flowering plants. And of course, ecosystems help us regulate the climate. So I ask you, where's the ecosystem in this ecosystem? If you are an insect, there's no way you're getting through here. If we look over here, there are no leaves. There's really, we just see mineral content for this poor tree to absorb any sort of nutrients. It's really a negative impact on the ecosystem. And why do we care about the lawn? Well, in the United States, the typical homeowner has a landscape that's 90% lawn. 40 million acres of lawn are in the US, and this is in 2005. This has changed dramatically because as of 2008, 500 square miles of new turf were added in the US each year. That's a tremendous amount of turf. And what are the costs of managing all of this lawn? 8 billion gallons of water per day. That's in 2008. We know we've added more lawn. We know we've added more turf, right? So not only are we impacting the ecosystem, but now we're using a lot of the resources that the ecosystem makes available to us. We're using 3 billion hours of our time. That's a lot of time to mow, to fertilize, and to remove the weeds that we use on these lawns. And lots of the fertilizers often come with a pesticide component because we don't want the grubs there, right? We don't want to feed the birds. We don't want the grubs, we'll eat the roots of the grass. So we get fertilizer with a chemical component. Well, most of those chemicals, 40% of those chemicals are banned in other countries because they are carcinogens. They are also linked to lymphoma. There are 75 plus studies that show how they're linked to lymphoma. We use 3 million tons. Now this is 2005, remember, 500 million acres we're adding a year. This is 2005, we were using 3 million tons of fertilizer per year. What happens to all of that? We're not using it properly. 40 to 60% of that fertilizer ends up in groundwater. That's a problem, right? We know we'll learn more about what groundwater, um, what that does, but it's not a good situation, especially if 14 of the pesticides Common pesticides are considered neurotoxins, 16 are carcinogens, and two thirds of them cause reproductive harm. If that is not bothersome enough, one lawnmower creates 89 pounds of CO2 and 34 pounds of other pollutants per year, each lawnmower. Think about your street. How many yards are there with a lawnmower? It, it's insane. It's a crazy amount of, um, energy and input that we put into our lawns. So we know that private landowners make up 60% of the land in the US. The Center for American Progress states that we need to preserve 30% of our land by 2030 to retain the current level of ecosystem services that we have. So that's what our ecosystem can do to help us clean the air, clean the water, make sure that nutrients are being recycled properly, right? So what can we do about that? Here's our ecosystem. We've got our little sign that says, do not disturb. So what I'm gonna ask of you is to become an eco warrior, become an eco gardener, because you have the land to do that. Your backyard is a perfect place for preservation. Your backyard is the perfect place to begin stormwater cleansing. Your backyard is the perfect place to support the ecosystem. So how can you do that, you ask? Well, First and foremost, PVD. If you are a Providence resident, you can take the pledge to become pesticide and fertilizer free. You can do that by going to sustainpvd.com. Take the pledge. If you're not a Providence resident, I'd start 
asking for the pledge in your town or in your city. If not, you can do it anyway. And we'll still say, yay, do it up. What else can you do? Well, in your own yard, you can create a nature preserve by reducing the lawn. I'm not saying completely eradicate the lawn. No lawns allowed, right? Everybody likes lawns. Our kids play on them. You know, we play frisbee. We don't want gardens everywhere. However, can you look at some areas and say, all right, I don't have to have lawn there. So this homeowner on the left, in the, the before picture, they have lawn right up to the tree. They expanded the lawn or they removed the lawn around the base of the tree. So now if you are a mason bee, you've got a spot that you can overwinter in, right? They took away some of the lawn here and created a path to walk to the front of the house. There's a lot less lawn there. So that means a lot less fertilizer, a lot less pesticide, a lot less labor, and a lot less water usage. Could you perhaps not just create borders around trees? Could you choose to do a low mow or no mow grass? The homeowners here on the right, the right-hand corner, have chosen the option of, you know what? We're just gonna let it go. We're gonna embrace the weeds, let it be, and let the grass grow. And quite frankly, I think that looks beautiful. I am 100% down with that because that gives me more time to relax in my yard and watch the birds and the bees and not have to worry about cutting the grass. The homeowner up top here has decided to create more borders and put in rain gardens. It's a wonderful way to decrease your time spent in the garden and to support the ecosystem around you. Another option is to go native. Right? This is one of the most important things that we can do. Native plants have evolved with the insects, the birds, the pollinators that we have in this region. So that means they are way better at one, pollinating the plants, two, utilizing the seeds, and three, our native plants will not require nearly as much water when as your grass does, or as another plant um, that is not native to this area, one that may come from China or Europe. And they make really great containers as well. We do that here at the Botanical Center. We try to incorporate natives in our containers to show that they are lovely, they are beautiful, and we're still working within the ecosystem that we're given. So the only caveat I have here is there's this new thing called native ours. Um, they're great and they're beautiful. And you, I understand that we're still working towards that native input, right? So they're native plants that have been cultivated to have something a little bit different about them. So there's one called Little Joe. It's Joe Pie Weed. It's called Little Joe because it grows a little bit shorter. Joe Pie Weed is enormous and gigantic. I am five feet tall. That plant can grow up to like six feet tall, I swear. Well, that's how it feels to me. <laughs> anyway, so if you get the Little Joe Pie Weed native bar, it has been shown that our native bees, mason bees and pollinators, do not appreciate that plant as much. They are not able to um, pollinate that plant as efficiently as straight up purple joe pie weed. So that would be my suggestion. If you can, replace some of your plants in your yard. You don't have to start with all of them. Take 25% of your yard, 25% of the grass, or just remove a few of your plants that you currently have and plant a few natives in place. And you're already on your way to creating your own nature preserve. What else can you do? Well, you can leave the leaves. We here at the Botanical Center are firm believers in leaving the leaves. They are an important nutrient source for overwintering insects and insects that are here throughout the year. They are extremely important in our nutrient cycle. They are habitat for fireflies and I would beg you to please do it for them because they are slowly going extinct in this area. Um, they the critters that live in the habitat of the leaf litter are food for other organisms like birds. They are the leaves once left in the garden make a perfect mulch. They help to increase the moisture in the garden. And sometimes people say to me, I just can't stand the look of them. It looks brown, it's ugly. So here's what I do in my own yard. I've got a couple of things that I do. For the front of the yard, which is a little bit more, you know, Keep up with the Joneses, right? You wanna make sure it looks good. So you take those leaves, you put them in a pile. I have my 18 year old go out there. He mows over them with the lawn. We rake them back over. He has an even more ingenious way because you know he likes to do things crazy. 
we have an aluminum trash can. He puts all the weeds in the aluminum trash can. He uses his weed whacker and he gets them all into the little tiny pieces. We put them on the garden. We do this as they fall because I don't wanna do it once eggs are nesting in the leaves, right? We do them as soon as they fall. We do it every week. We do a little bit more, a little bit more. So instead of going out to rake leaves, I'm just going out as they fall and chopping them up and throwing them in the gardens. This provides a food source throughout the entire year. If you don't like the look of the brown, I suggest co covering them with compost. So in the back gardens, I don't bother chopping up the leaves. I just put the leaves on entirely whole and then I cover them with compost. So I'm giving the so soil microorganisms a perfect ratio of nutrients. You're getting seven to one. The leaves, seven, that's my carbon. Nitrogen, one carbon for every seven, or one nitrogen for every seven carbons. So I've got leaves, that's my carbon input. I put on the compost, that's my nitrogen input. I'm feeding the ecosystem that lives in the soil. So Ryan, I think that you are gonna do the video for me. So I will stop sharing so Ryan can share the video that we have from the Botanical Center. And eventually we definitely would like to have this uh, workshop be, you know, in the field, in person, maybe at the Botanical Center. Uh, but for now, this is, this is what we have, a video of, of Leanne at the Botanical Center. Hi, so we are here at the Roger Williams Park Botanical Center in our perennial gardens. We manage our perennial gardens in two different methods. We leave some beds with the leaves in the fall we don't cut a whole lot back. And then we leave two other beds the way the normal homeowner manages their landscape. We cut everything back. We remove all of the debris. We rake up the leaves. And today I'm going to show you the difference of those two methods of maintenance for your yard and what that entails, not just for the ecosystem, but for the health of the plants as well. Here we have an area where we have left the leaves. And you can see we've got quite a bit of leaf debris here. And as I start to move the leaves, you'll notice that the soil is wet. So we've got a lot of water retention. We'll see some other things happening here. We can see that as we keep going down, we start getting wildlife. It's gonna start moving away from us, of course. But there, we can see a little snail hiding in there. All these leaves are stuck together. And here we have a leaf that's half eaten. The importance of this is that that's organic matter that's being broken down by all those little organisms. We go even further, now we can see those little organisms, right? The ones that we can see, an earthworm just went hiding in there. This is so very important. I know lots of us put compost on our garden beds in the fall or in the spring, but plant roots are not able to take advantage of compost unless something like this little pill bug comes along and helps us decompose that. See this little guy? He will come along, he will eat the leaves, eat all of that debris that's left over, and then once he eats it, of course, as all insects do, they go to the bathroom, create frass. It rains, that frass has nutrients in it, that's when the roots can absorb all of the nutrients that you put down in your compost. This, for us, is our compost. It's free, it's nature-made, it's perfect. It creates an environment not just for nutrients for your plants, but it also creates an environment for the overall ecosystem. So all these little organisms that are living in here, the earthworms are food for the birds, the birds are food for bigger birds, raptor birds, and other animals like small foxes. We are supporting an entire ecosystem, not just our green plants, which we adore, but the bigger, larger picture that these plants are part of. And here are the beds that we do not leave the leaves on. And as you can see, they are entirely different. We don't see any living wildlife. We see nothing here, no insects. Oh, we've got an ant. We have one lone ant. And then if we look at the soil texture, there's not much to it. It's the mulch and then the soil. And most of this is mineral content. We don't have any leaves that I have broken down. The moisture content isn't nearly as much as it was with the leaves. So it's so important to leave the leaves for your plants. 
but it's even more important to leave the leaves for the wildlife and the ecosystem that it supports. If you want something other than just ants, leave your leaves. Okay. Thank you, Leanne. Now you can uh, start sharing in and continue on with your presentation. Thank you, Ryan, for showing that. I appreciate you taking the time to film that as well. <laughs> so as you can see, you know, leaving the leaves is, yes, it's a methodology of creating some compost in situ in your gardens. And we did not chop our leaves. We left them whole. We put them in there. I can tell you that those garden beds consistently outperform the beds where we remove the leaves each year. So what else can you do to create your own nature preserve? Something that is near and dear to my heart um, are fireflies. I think I've mentioned that already. And here you have a before and after photo of a power outage in the Northeast in 2003. 55 million people were left without power. And you can see the difference in the two photos of the same house, right? So you can reduce the light. 20 to 50% of the light lost to the night sky just kind of goes up there and you know is lighting the sky. There's no need for that. We don't need to make sure the stars get home safely, right? We need to make sure we get home safely, that's it. We need to see where we're walking. But when we do this, we impact the, um, our, our own selves. There is increased obesity, depression, sleep disorders, diabetes, breast cancer, which is crazy. Um, it also negatively impacts the ecosystem. It negatively impacts the sleep patterns of birds, their capacity to reproduce. Birds do not sleep in nests outside of when they lay their eggs. They sleep in the trees. So they're hanging out up here in the branches trying to get some rest. Can you just imagine how difficult it would be to try to sleep in this tree with this gigantic light shining in your face the entire time? It also impacts how plants flower. We all know we get poinsettias in the winter time, right? Poinsettias are, um, they flower or they turn red according to the amount of light that they get. So you could take a poinsettia and force it to turn red in the middle of summer by keeping it in the dark and then turning on the lights just for two minutes. It doesn't have to be an entire day or a shortened day, just for two minutes. You're tricking the plant into believing that the day light is shorter. So it's going to start creating um, that red look, that red hue. So light has a tremendous impact on our ecosystem. I think many of us don't sleep well. Part of that is because of the amount of light we have, right? So one of my most favorite organizations is darksky.org. And they put together um, you know, ways that you can reduce the light, the, the top reasons why and how you can do it. You only need to light the area that needs to be lit. As I said, you don't need to light the sky, you need to light your feet to see where you're going, right? The light doesn't need to be brighter than necessary, minimize blue light emissions. And I like these two pictures because they show a before and after. Here's your before. Can you imagine being a bird in there? There's no way you're gonna sleep. If you're interested in looking at the cars, if you're interested in looking at your path, you don't need light emitting way up into the sky or shooting out way into these, the trees. What you do need is light at your feet. You want to see where you're going. You want to make sure nobody's coming around your house. So you point the light down at the ground, not up. One of the new landscape trends is to have lights shining up into your trees. And yes, they're gorgeous. The trees are beautiful. Can you imagine a bird trying to sleep in that tree? No, thanks. I'll pass on, right? It's really lights are really impacting um, light pollution. They're impacting birds. They're impacting us. They're impacting the ecosystem as a whole. So as lovely as your tree may look lit up, try if you can to let it go and light down. So that is it for my presentation. I do hope that you guys decide to take the pledge, no pesticide and fertilizer free. If you can't do it all the way, just try a little bit of the way. Try to reduce your lawn, not the whole thing. You don't have to get rid of the whole thing, just part of it. Plant your natives, 
leave the leaves, please leave the leaves and reduce the light. And thank you so very much. I hope you send us some pictures of what your backyard nature preserve looks like. I know you can do it and thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Leanne. That was great. You're welcome. Uh, we, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, one is if you do want a small portion of lawn, is there a more environmentally friendly variety of grass that requires maybe less watering and no mm -hmm. fertilizer or pesticides? Yeah, absolutely. So I would go for native seed grasses. I would also perhaps choose a Lomo grass. There are plenty of those. Um, Allen Seed Company has lots of those. You could check the, them out. Um, you know, URI does make a seed mix. Not all of it is native to our area, but oftentimes it is um, made for less moisture um, intensity. So it would need less watering. So yeah. Okay. And uh, one other one, uh, is there a good resource to find native plants in Rhode Island? Yeah, there are lots of places in Rhode Island. Farmer's Daughter um, has native plants. There's a Blue Moon Nursery that has native plants. Lots of nurseries have them. You can look at the tags. Um, and again, just be aware that they're not native ours, that they are natives. I went to a nursery on Sunday for Mother's Day and I noticed a whole table. And you know, this is a regular nursery. They don't normally you know, push for natives or anything like that. They had a whole table and they had a big sign that said native plants here. So it's definitely something that's increasing. I think you will see more and more of that. Um, and keep asking for it. If you don't see it, that's the best way, right? Supply and demand. Right, okay. Well, that's all the questions we have right now. So if people do have questions, uh, you can write them into the question and answer part of the Zoom call and we will circle back to, we'll have a larger question and answer section at the end of the presentation as well. So, I just, but for now, we, oh, go ahead. I do have one question from Holly Ewald to all panelists. Oh, okay. What is the best way to get rid of invasive plants such as mustard garlic? So there are a few ways that you can try to tackle that. The best way is the mechanical method, which is these, right? To use your hands, use a little shovel, try to go through and pull it up. If you can't do that, at least go out and always pick the flowers off because you're controlling the seeds for the next seed bed. You're trying to eradicate the seeds. So pick your flowers try to remove it as best as you can. You can't do it all at once. Be forgiving of yourself. Work slowly. Be patient. And that would be my best advice for that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you. We'll circle back to more questions uh, at the end of everyone's presentations. And now we'll move on to Amelia and Steve with uh, Groundwork Rhode Island. Hi. Thanks so much, Leanne. I, I learned a lot. <laughs> um, so my name is Amelia Rose. I'm the Executive Director of Groundwork Rhode Island. Thanks everyone for being here. And I'm joined by Steve Ritchie, who's our Director of Field Operations. I'm gonna share my screen and um, start our presentation. We are gonna be talking about um, some of the things, building off of what Leanne uh, talked about in terms of getting rid of your lawn and doing other things that will uh, capture stormwater on your property, talking about residential stormwater retrofits. And we wanted to be as practical as possible. And so we're gonna be giving you just different um, examples of, of projects that Groundwork has done, as well as um, other partners that we work with and uh, giving you estimates of cost and time that it will take and maintenance and all those kinds of questions that kind of getting down to the, the ground level of um, what it takes to put these things in. And I just wanted to recognize uh, Jacqueline Hall, who is not uh, presenting with us, but she helped us put together this presentation and she's a new staff member at Groundwork. So just to give, um, for folks who don't aren't familiar with Groundwork, um, we are a community-based nonprofit. We have an office in Pawtucket, but we do work all over the state. We focus a lot on the urban communities of Providence, Pawtucket, and Central Falls. Our main programs that we run are our adult job training program that focuses on environmental services. We have a ground core landscaping uh, social venture uh, that Steve runs and that we hire people from our, who graduate from our adult job training program uh, for that um, social venture. So we, it's an employment program and we also uh, do the physical environmental improvements um, in urban communities through that 
structure. We also have a composting program called Harvest Cycle, which is a subscription-based um, food scrap collection service. And then we process the food scraps into compost at um, a couple of community gardens uh, in Providence and soon to be Pawtucket. And we have a youth employment program for high school students that's uh, in the summer and also uh, after school in the academic year. And our overall mission is to uh, make physical environmental improvements, improve the environment in urban communities and create economic opportunities and employment uh, for local residents. So some of the things um, to just consider uh, as you're thinking about uh, doing some a kind of a stormwater project on your property is to think about your property itself. Do you have a yard? How much space do you have? Where is your downspout that carries water from your roof? Um, down onto you know the pavement or into a grassy area. Is there any unused paved space on, sp paved space on your property? How do you use your yard and any outdoor paved space? Do you is there you know parking that you need to have? Um, do you uh, do you want a yard that you can play frisbee like Leanne talked about? Um, and also, you know, other things like, do you enjoy gardening? Do you want plants that you have to maintain and uh, weed? And do you enjoy that kind of thing? Or are you willing to learn <laughs> to enjoy it? And also, you know, for renters, um, can your project be permanent? Uh, have you talked to your landlord and um, does the, or are you the property owner who can make these um, changes? So thinking about, you know, you can do different projects that are temporary or permanent, uh, but just kind of having these questions in mind if you're starting out, thinking about a new project um, on your property. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Steve to talk about more in depth on that site analysis piece. All right, so site analysis, when you're getting into a project, um, any type of green infrastructure project on your property, there's a lot of things that you have to look over. Uh, site, analysis, site analysis can actually be one of the most important things when you're putting in one of these systems. Um, which border? Do you want to capture water from your roof driveway? That's the first thing to think about. Uh, look around your property, find out what's pervious, what's not pervious, um, and figure out exactly what you're going to capture. Um, the second thing is utilities, septic systems, irrigations. Uh, there are many times irrigation lines are only buried three inches deep. So a lot of times when we're doing rain gardens and you're going a foot down or you know, you're going two to three feet down, your irrigation lines are going to be floating in the middle of this rain garden, so they actually have to all be moved, which can be extremely costly. Um, septic systems, where, where your leach field is, you don't want to be adding basically another leach field of a green infrastructure system if you were to put in a bioswale or a uh, rain garden. So anytime we have septic systems, 10 feet is the, um, actually, I believe 20 feet is the rule on septic systems from the leach field, not just the, the system itself. So you actually have to get the plans, which are all available at the DEM. They're all submitted, submitted when your property is built. Um, as for any type of underground utilities, there's gas lines under there, water lines under there, sewer lines. Uh, some people have buried electric. It could even be just a simple lamp post that runs out into your yard. Um, these things all have to be looked for. You don't want to hit a hit a pipe, have any type of, you know, issues like that. Um, and also anytime you're dealing with utilities, walls, pipes, anything that's in concrete, even drainage basins that are out that the city has in your sidewalks, you're going to want to stay 10 feet as well. Uh, anytime that you're digging past a foot in the ground, you have a chance at actually collapsing something that might be a structure that's raised. So you want to keep that in mind. The next thing you look at is the sun. What angle is it? Do you have full part? That's all going to be determined on any types of plants that you select and even rain barrels. Um, we've seen rain barrels where if it's in a really sunny area, they might not choose a clear or a white rain barrel because UV, UV rays can go into the rain barrel and actually cause algae growth um, inside your rain barrel and cause the water to really come out with a stench. So simple things like that you don't really think about when you're deciding on a rain barrel, but that's why the site analysis becomes so important. Um, what direction does the water flow? Does the yard have a slope? Um, we've seen homeowners come out to us and say they started a rain garden project and uh, they don't really know if it's doing anything and they kind of want us, you know, to help and it's at the top of the slope instead of the bottom of the slope they're trying to catch the water before it goes down, rather than actually catching the flow of the water so that's something to always look for you want to actually, you know, uh, capture the water rather than prevent water from from flowing over in any of these smaller type systems. Uh, what type of soil you have. 
soil analysis is extremely important because most of these systems, except for rain barrels, uh, it's basically all water percolation. How quick is the water percolating into the soil and absorbing into the soil and moving away? Most of these systems we usually like 24 hours to have no puddling in. That's usually the general rule. Um, sometimes if you have a property, um, especially in the northern area of the state, there's a lot of ledge, there's a lot of stone, there's a lot of rock. And when you go to do a perk test, you might not have an area that's going to perk. It might be clay, which almost acts like a pool liner. And next thing you know, instead of installing a rain garden, you install the pond. So um, soil type is a very, very important thing. Um, and don't place it already where water tends to pool. Again, it goes right back to the soil. Obviously, the soil in that spot isn't doing what it needs to do. It's not percolating. So if you place it where you already have a pool of water, uh, you know, you're going to be in trouble. You're just going to end up with a bigger pool of water. So, uh, you know, at that point, you'd retrofit it. You'd get the grade. You'd get some loam soil or stone or however you're regrading your property. And you would grade the water to come out of that puddle and grade and flow into your system. And also av avoid large roots. Roots are going to go into the system. They're going to tangle it. Uh, they're going to hurt the system. You can hurt the tree by dealing with the roots. If it's heavily rooted area, most likely you're not going to percolate. And you're also going to just be kind of fighting over nutrients with the tree and a lot of plants won't survive. Great. So now we're going to just go into a, um, a list of uh, different examples of types of stormwater retrofits that you can do at your own home. Some of the pictures um, that we're showing are of private, like larger uh, commercial properties or, you know, churches or nonprofits. And so it's kind of a mix of different things. But um, we also, so we all of the, we kind of standardized the different uh, slides. So we're going to go through each example tell you kind of our sense of the difficulty level of, of doing installing each type of um, feature, what kinds of materials and equipment you need, the space needed, the approximate cost, and the frequency of maintenance and the types of maintenance that you need to, um, to do. Um, Steve, do you want to take this one? Sure. So these are rain gardens. We marked it as a difficulty two out of three. Um, not the easiest, but you know, not anything that's going to be um, really all that brutal, depending sometimes if you get a yard that's nothing but big boulders and rocks, you could be in trouble, but um, that's rare. So basically, um, these usually typically on any property are anywhere between 10 by 10, 20 by 20. We've done large ones that go across the front lawn, uh, you know, that have different rivers and streams that we make go into them. So you can do anything with a rain garden, really. This is an example here on the right, uh, was done at the south, uh, the Southside Cultural Center. This is actually taken, this is a very large one. Um, this is about, I think, 20 feet by 100 feet. Uh, this is showing the front portion. Uh, this one has trees in it besides shrubs, plants. So this, this is a very large one and a very large scale rain garden. Uh, but this is taken on most of the parking lot water from this. So this one being a large system is actually built the same way as a small system. Uh, you need some wheelbarrows, stick tools, your plant material, your crushed stone, and your engineered soil. Um, your plant materials and uh, are all going to be based off your site analysis and your sun and whatnot. Anytime we plant a rain garden, we plant into the lowest point of the rain garden is where you're going to have the plants that absorb and can handle wet areas because that area is going to stay wet and moist for the longer period of time. And on the outer banks, we usually put things because that can handle uh, sometimes roadway salt going in it, high heat, sand, debris, so they can really take a beat. And so the difference in one unit uh, the plant difference is actually night and day on what actually goes on the outer ring in the inner ring. Um, like I stated in site analysis, you're going to want to be away from 10 feet from any walls, foundations, your house, your shed, septic systems. Again, if you end up digging four feet down, even though you're replacing it with soil, you can still collapse something because the original compaction of the land disappears. Um, your space needs depends on the volume of the water from your roof or driveway or whatever you're, you're, you're capturing it on. Uh, there are several tools online that you could do that for where they'll actually ask you how big's your roof and it'll give you how much space you need um, to capture rainwater in like, you know, a, a quarter inch rain event or a half inch rain event. Um, in small spaces, rain gardens can be dug deeper. So one thing about rain gardens is some people are always upset and they say, well, I don't really have the room for a 10 by 10 rain garden. So if you do the calculations and you needed a 10 by 10 rain garden, um, in reality, a 10 by 10 rain garden that's dug two feet down, you know, instead of doing that, you could do a 
uh, you know, you could do a five by five and go four feet down. Um, so basically the volume can be also held in depth rather than surface area. Uh, so that's nice because you can stick these in in small areas sometimes if you, if you don't really have that much space. The approximate cost, the average one costs between $2,500 and $5,000. Um, if you do it yourself, it can be done a lot cheaper. It also depends, again, how big you want to go. Some people really want to plant it like crazy. They don't have to be planted crazy like this. A lot of times, um, you know, the, the example to the right is heavily planted and it's, you know, done, you know, very designered. And uh, but we're also maintaining that one. And, and I'm maintaining it personally with, with the crew at Groundwork. So, um, you know, we, we know how to maintain it. other areas where, you know, you might have a landscaper that might not know as many plants and stuff. So you're going to design it simpler. So again, that all changes in your price. Sometimes you can spend $2,000 just in plants. Other times you can just spend $50. So um, a, lot, a lot can be changed um, cost-wise based on plants. Maintenance frequency. At the beginning, there's a lot of maintenance. You're going to do a lot of watering. A lot of new weeds are going to form. Things are going to blow in there. Uh, but then after that, it's really, you know, bi-weekly weedings, making sure things are okay. They'll take care of themselves water-wise once the plants are established. Um, usually you have to go in there and deadhead and chop things down in the fall um, and just give it a, a good cleanup in the spring. So um, it's usually like a four time a year or bi-weekly maintenance, but other than that, two big cleanups or maybe four times to bi-weekly, depending on how often you wanna weed it, uh, the maintenance gets less frequent with the amount of years that it's in. Here are some just examples of pictures um, from Aquidneck Island uh, that were projects that we, uh, Groundwork Rhode Island did with the Eastern Rhode Island Conservation District um, as part of a grant that they were working on. And uh, just some examples of different rain gardens when they were first planted. Uh, here are a few more showing um, a nice, you know, coming down from the downspout with the rocks to sort of slow down the water from the downspout and then going into a nice rain garden, taking up all that grass that Leanne wanted us to take up. So <laughs> I'm glad that, glad that we have a good example of that. These are just some um, examples of uh, rain garden plants that you can use that are native. These are all from the uh, URI native plant list. Um, and uh, you know, you can take a look now, but also come back to this later as a resource. And we have a bunch of um, links at the end of this presentation of different resources that you can get from DEM's website, URI, um, Save the Bay. There's so many great resources of folks who have been doing this work for a long time and um, especially you know, knowing uh, what kind of native plants that you can, you can plant in a rain garden. Um, some other uh, considerations, some things that Steve was talking about before in terms of the species selection for plants. Uh, that there's different moisture levels, the edges of the rain garden versus the center. So just thinking about that, obviously aesthetic considerations, you know, thinking about, do you want to do mainly grasses or do you want to do more of a formal garden uh, with plants? Uh, here are some two pictures of different examples. This is a on the left, there is a, a large rain garden. Uh, it's a swale that's at JT Owens Park in, um, in Providence that our crew and also uh, a youth crew from the Nature Conservancy uh, did some weeding in a few years ago. And, uh, but it's, it's a lot less maintenance, even though it looks kind of big and unwieldy, it's kind of a, you mow it down uh, and you can, you know, weed it once or, you know, do kind of maintenance once or twice a year versus kind of on the right, having a green garden with more plants. Um, that's a, just a little bit more complicated the way that uh, Steve described. So, uh, requires a little bit more maintenance. I wanted to mention that this on the right is an example of a rain garden that a Save the Bay employee, Jed Thorpe, who um, some folks probably know, he did this at his um, house and took up his lawn and he did all the labor himself. And he told me that this rain garden only cost him about $150 uh, for the plants. He was able to take some plants from other parts of his property and uh, just bought a few things and uh, bought the stones and, but used all on the soil from his, his lawn and said it was a great project, but uh, you know, it was a lot of labor hours. So it's sort of, you know, rain gardens can be kind of whatever you make it, <laughs> whatever your um, weekend warrior, um, you know, gardening uh, desires are. And um so that's, I think, everything I wanted to say. A anything to add, uh, Steve? To any anything here on this stage? Uh, no, yeah. I mean, you're right on. It's the the pictures speak for themselves. You know, kind of the the left being in a park and the right being a residential, and and you can just see the planting difference. 
did, we wanted to show this uh, picture because um, back in 2014, uh, Groundwork or Ground Corps did a uh, rain garden uh, installation at the Rhode Island Community Food Bank. Uh, and here it is in the winter, it was like fall uh, when we did that um, installation. And then a few years later, you know, here's the wild, <laughs> the wildness that developed, which it looks really beautiful in my mind. Um, and, uh, but just kind of thinking about setting your expectations when you first plant something and that goes for anything, not just a rain garden uh, and like what it's gonna look like in the winter versus what's it gonna look like when it's beautiful in the summertime. Uh, and you can see some of the beauty in the winter as well with the red twig dogwoods and all, or, and all that, but, um, you know, you just have to kind of set your expectations and also, you know, realize that when you plant something in the beginning, it's going to grow <laughs> and it's going to take some time to grow as well into full maturity. Uh, these are just some uh, uh, diagrams that we took from a Save the Bay, uh, the Bay Friendly um, Landscape or Bay Friendly Homes uh, guide that they have on their website, which is which is a really great resource talking about rain gardens and how to kind of make your lawn and your the front yard into more of a sponge and uh, sort of the, a general kind of what does a rain garden look like um, uh, graphic over here. All right, we're not gonna, um, Steve, I'll let you do rain barrels. We're not gonna talk about this one too much in depth because um, when Ask Potuck at River Watershed Council is gonna be talking about rain barrels as well, but we'll give you a few tips as well. Sure, yeah, uh, just to give an overview so the Winoska Pawtucket River Watershed Council can really go in depth with it. But, you know, usually um, anytime we put on rain barrels, they're usually 55 gallon, uh, 55 gallon barrels. We've done all the way up to 2,000 gallon cisterns. Um, you can get a diverter kit at any local hardware store, um, you know, that, that diverts it so it doesn't have to be right on the gutter. It can be far away. Uh, you know, it's a smaller space needed. Um, you can get these barrels sometimes from like the Coca-Cola plant or star pickling. Um, you know, you're always going to want to use food grade barrels, but the barrels are pretty, pretty usual. You know, you can usually find them pretty easy. Um, a lot of towns and cities organizations actually offer free rain barrels. So that's something to kind of keep your, um, you know, eyes open for. Professionally, they can be installed for usually around $125. That's with the kit, the barrel, the whole nine yards. That's actually what our organization charges. Um, and the maintenance, uh, they're pretty simple in the spring and fall, you know, there's the diverters, you turn them inside out, uh, so they don't divert in the winter, so you don't, you know, fill up with ice and you just leave the spigot open, so that way you don't have ice go in there and crack break or uh, damage any of the system. So very little room needed, very little maintenance, um, the cost is very low on these, so a very simple, easy thing you can do um, to help capture stormwater. Um so bioswales on the opposite end of the spectrum, <laughs> we get we gave it the three hammer <laughs> difficulty level. This one, you know, often takes a, more of a professional crew, but it's definitely something that you still can do um, as a homeowner. And I'm going to kind of speed us up because I think we're uh, running a little bit over time. So you know, just all the same kinds of things, materials, equipment, same kinds of things as the rain garden, ten feet away from all the foundations. You know, you can go wild with bioswales. They cost, they can cost a lot of money, or they can cost a little bit of money depending on the space that you're, uh, the amount of space that you're. Uh, if you have to depave, or if you're just using, um, you know, the right of way that already has a grass strip, um, and again, the maintenance and watering is more important in the first year. These are just examples of bioswales that um, our ground core crew has done. Two different um, examples. One, this is kind of a, the first iteration that we had on Dexter Street in Providence. And then this is a new design that we uh, put together based on um, some learning that we had from the city of New Haven in Connecticut. And this is on Allen's Avenue. And um, just so this was in the right of way and a public right of way. And uh, we did this in front of a restaurant on Allen's Avenue. Downspout planting. This is what uh, Steve can do, and he this is one he can do because he doesn't like it. <laughs> or he thinks it's too. He thinks it's too hard. <laughs> they're, they're, these are really nice, um, but they, they're they're very difficult um, for like a beginning or someone that's going to do them at home. So what what's going on in here, really quick, is the top area, the the, the water is diverted as you can see from the the black pipe that comes out to the downspout, and it's used to water basically a flower box. The extra water that the plants don't absorb go through a filter and end up on the bottom of the box, which is basically an elongated rain barrel, which has an overflow and a spigot on it. Um, 
these have been known to backfill clog and have some issues. So the maintenance can actually be a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, that there's some planting maintenance, but it's basically a flower box with a rain barrel underneath it. Um, they are starting to sell kits. Um, they're between 250 and $500 and professionally install. You're probably going to double that in labor. Um, they're aesthetically beautiful, um, but they are starting to have some problems with um, also you can see the white pipe is a vent because you need a vent on these in order for the water to vent in order to get to the bottom of the box and then use it for a spigot. And um, some of the research I was doing yesterday has issues with squirrels and chipmunks throwing things down there making nests and whatnot. So they're just very difficult to maintain on top of building if you're going to kind of do a DIY, um, uh, you know, home install. Again, it's it's basically like a rain barrel on steroids kind of and, and you know aesthetically pleasing rain barrels you're not just looking at a barrel but um functionally um they they there's still a little bit of ways to go i think personally when when it comes time to some of these rain boxes from what we've seen in the field anyway yeah we'd love to hear if anybody has one at their house and it's been working well um so just building off of what Leanne was talking about you know turning your lawn into into more of a meadow and having plantings this again can be as big or as small as you want um it's basically all you just need is gardening tools um soil amendments and you can go wild with plants and depending on the space um in terms of cost um and these are just some pictures that we got just from people who might be on this phone call. Some, some folks in Rhode Island who um, I just um, tapped to send us pictures of their yards. Uh, people who, uh, you know, take the right of way in front of their house, in front of their property and just plant wildflowers um, instead of having just a grass strip there um, and, you know, having a more sterile grass strip. This is in front of um, someone's um, house that she's a avid gardener as well. And I wanted to show this picture over on the right because um, this is the same person as the Black Eyed Susan person uh, picture, but you know it's a little bit simpler in the front lawn uh, or the front yard area. It's just there's a ground cover, there's a, a few grasses and things in the right of way, but it's not super. You know, doesn't it's not doesn't seem like super maintenance heavy. It, it will help absorb water. It'll help with. Um, you know, not just having uh, kind of a grass, uh, grassy area, but um, so it adds a little bit more life and a little bit uh, more uh, ecosystem benefits, but it doesn't seem as um, maintenance heavy as some of the other things with more plants and they can, which can look beautiful um, certain times of year or when you are really um, focus on maintenance, but can also kind of get unruly. So you want to kind of balance those things and think about how much time you want to spend um, maintaining things. Uh, these are just, again, some other examples of deep paving projects that we've done, that Groundwork has done in the past, where we've done some plantings in the right of way and um, added grasses um, and trees um, as a way just you know, just to take up pavement and add some per, uh, permeable surfaces uh, to absorb stormwater. Uh, not directly capturing stormwater, like in a kind of rain garden sense, but just um, as water lands or come, if it comes off of um, the sidewalk, um, any little bit helps. Um, and that leads us into depaving, which is a, another three, three hammer. <laughs> and these can also cause, um, cost a lot of money. Um, they can, depending on the size of the uh, area that you wanna depave. Uh, you also need to have an asphalt saw. This is something that you can rent, uh, like from Home Depot or something like that, um, or you can hire a crew to do it. And um, these are just some pictures of larger projects that we've done at commercial properties. Um, this was a few years ago, um, a property on Westminster Street where we took up, I think it was like 450 or 500 square feet of pavement and planted um, a bunch of fruit trees. Uh, the, here's a residential job that we did where with our job training program where someone just want, had an unused piece of their parking lot in the back of their house and wanted to create a, a yard, some grass. So here's a nice use of grass, I guess. <laughs> Maybe they added some plantings to it. But, um, you know, it's just uh, kind of thinking through like, well, what if there's a, a spot on my in, in my backyard that I don't use for parking and then it's paved? can I do something there that will um, add some kind of green um, element to kind of for my own, you know, happiness and mental health and having a nice yard in the back. 
Um, here is uh, a project that uh, Groundwork did with the Wenasquatucket River Watershed Council in the Pleasant Valley Parkway, where um, we our crew depaved just a slice of uh, a strip of the driveway and replaced that part of the driveway with permeable pavers. So you can just kind of see the process of using the asphalt saw, cutting it, cutting it out, laying the bricks, the permeable pavers, doing a little sweep. And that would be also kind of the, the general maintenance that you would need to get sediment that might collect um, when stormwater flows over it. So sweeping that every once in a while. And, you know, it looks really nice. Uh, it's just sort of a simple addition to the driveway. Um, it takes a lot of work um, and it's not uh, super cheap, but it's, um, it's something that can be done at uh, a residential home. Uh, oh, actually, uh, wow, that was done. Do you have anything to add to that, Steve, about the um, permeable driveways? Yeah, the, uh, the permeable driveways, you know, like you said, they're aesthetically pleasing. They're great. I, right now we're having a little bit of problem with the maintenance because you got to kind of get out there and sometimes vac the, uh, vacuum the joints. They're kind of filling with, with sediment and whatnot. But um, for a homeowner that uh, is, is ready to do maintenance and they want to you know research it and learn how to maintain them they really are great this one right here i mean you can run the hose at the top of the driveway and it sucks down all the rainwater uh, all the hose water or rainwater whatever's going on from that whole driveway before it gets into the street and goes into the into the basin and out into the river so they 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 really work well and here are just our resources page, how we put this presentation together. Again, just the stormwater solutions page for uh, at Rhode Island DEM. There's a lot of um, fact sheets and rain garden, the rain garden uh, maintenance and installation fact sheets, the URI cooperative extension. Um, Save the Bay has a great, um, the Bay friendly tips for their uh, backyards. And um, if anyone wants to get, to get in touch with Groundwork, this is our email address, info at groundworkri.org and our website, and that is it. I will stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Stephen and Amelia. That was great. I'm going to just show a, a quick, a short video of a homeowner that had a rain garden installed at their house and uh, get her sort of uh, feedback on, on how she is liking it. Hi, welcome to beautiful Newport, Rhode Island. My name is Chris McCullough, and uh, this is our home, my ho our meaning my husband's and mine. And I want to introduce you to my rain garden. Chris participated in a collaborative project between the Rhode Island Green Infrastructure Coalition, the Eastern Rhode Island Conservation District, Clean Ocean Access, and the Aquidneck Land Trust that engages residents and businesses on Aquidneck Island to improve water quality. Funding for this project was obtained through the Van Buren Charitable Foundation. The gentleman who came, the team that came and put this rain garden in, knew what they were doing and they were professional and quick. It took two hours for them to do it. We have uh, leaf uh, filters on our gutters um, and so the water just comes right down the spout, comes out this wonderful little black snaky tube here through the uh, rocks which leads it right into the reservoir. There's a little reservoir in here with uh, other aquifers the water flows right into that center, into the ground, rather than out into the street um, and dragging pollutants with it. It seems, I don't have any puddles here, I don't have any standing water, so the mosquito thing is okay. One of the small things I have to do though to maintain the garden is uh, reintroduce the mulch each year. Uh, just because, you know, it scatters, it, it, you know, the animals come through and drag it around. <laughs> <laughs> once in a while. So it's good to just, you know, build up the burn a little bit to keep the water in. Again, nourish the plants. And as you can see, um, do I have green lawns? No, it's mostly flowers, folks. Why? Because it attracts birds, bees. I've seen um, monarch butterflies, hummingbirds. I think the neighbors are really applaud this little garden. I think people are happily curious. So hopefully at this seminar, more people will get on board. It's a good thing to do. Okay, uh, so we do have a couple of questions here uh, for Amelia and Steve. Um, one is, 
would it be better to size a rain garden too large and possibly not fully fill up during a small rain event or size it too small where it overflows during a large rain event? If you don't, I guess, if you don't get it exactly perfect. So that's one of the, that's it. It's actually a personal choice. Um, usually if you go on the websites through the calculations, we always do it for a big one inch rainstorm or like worst case scenario. Um, that, that's how we like to design ours. We, we over-design. Um, a lot of people don't maybe want to make it as big. They'll under-design, but they put an overflow outlet in the back so that when it does overflow, the rain will actually still go through their yard and, and snake back into the road. So a lot of them, they actually make overflows for, um, but that is a good point. I, I personally, when we do them, we, we go worst case scenario, we, we go way over what it should be. Um, it, it also depends, I mean, you know, how big, you know, if you're doing it for a really big house or a church or something, a lot of, you know, a lot of surface area, then sometimes you can't, you just don't have the money or the space to actually design it for the worst case scenario or for a big storm. That's when you'll put that overflow in. So at least you're slowing down the water through the system. Okay. Uh, the other is mo more of a comment uh, that Sheila Dormady says that she loves her planter box at her house, that she is directing water into the into a planter planter box. So they are working. Beautiful. No squirrels. Good. They are, they are working. <laughs> Okay, uh, and that's all the questions I have for now. Uh, so we'll, yeah, we'll move on to Jake and Sarah and their presentation. Yep. All right, hi everybody, good evening. We are just trying to get our cameras started over here. Oh no. So I don't think you're going to be able to see us today, but that's okay because we have a really great presentation for you instead that you're going to be able to enjoy and look at. So I'm just going to get our presentation started really quickly. Okay, can everybody see? The screen here for a rain barrel workshop. Yep, we can see that. Awesome. Um, so good evening, everybody. My name is Sarah. I'm the education director for the Wenasquatucket River Watershed Council. My name is Jacob Gorky. I'm a ranger for the Wenasquatucket River Watershed Council. And um, the Wenasquatucket River Watershed Council, if you haven't heard of us, we're an environmental nonprofit working in Providence, Rhode Island to protect and restore the Wenasquatucket River. And we do that through a variety of different programs, um, but the program specifically that we're gonna talk about really quickly with you all tonight is our upcoming rain barrel workshop. And there are so many benefits of a rain barrel. So our friends from Groundworks really covered the basis of why adding a rain barrel to your existing yards or lawns would be something really beneficial. Um, the first of which would be that you could really reduce the amount of stormwater runoff you have. Um, stormwater is just excess water from rain, snow, precipitation events. Um, and our stormwater tends to be a huge source for where pollution can travel from our land and into our rivers. Um, another massive benefit of installing a rain barrel in your uh, area is just you're alleviating the stress that you're putting on, say you have other stormwater systems in place like a bioswale um, or a rain garden like we saw earlier. Um, those systems can handle a lot of water but if they're inundated, that can create some issues. So by having a rain barrel, you're reducing that excess of water, which is a really, really great plus. Um, all of the water that you have in your rain barrel, you're recycling, you're using water that would otherwise just flow into your yard and eventually back into the river. Instead, you're taking that water and you're using it for something special. Um, we are reusing plastic containers, so I know Steve mentioned this, that a lot of great organizations you can 
uh, grab a barrel from, stain it, and then turn it into a rain barrel for your home. Um, we partner with Coca-Cola for our workshop and Coca-Cola actually donates all of the barrels that we use. So it's definitely very possible and easy for you to partner with somebody else if you are interested in doing your own rain barrel. Um, and it's great to be able to reuse something that otherwise uh, would just be utilized or thrown away. Um, our rain barrels, so we prime our barrels and then we paint them together, which is a wonderful way to personalize your property and create something really beautiful. And then the last piece is that you can actually save money. Um, there's a huge law that's currently up for debate in legislation to talk about retrofits for homes and how that could create incentive. So you may be able to get more money for having stormwater retrofit at your home. Okay guys, I'm gonna go over um, some basic steps for installation of your rain barrel. Um, the first thing to do would be to gather your materials. As Sarah mentioned, um, barrels themselves can be found through local organizations. If you are interested in purchasing one, they can also be found online for anywhere between $50, $60, $70. like um, Fastenal, Harbor Freight, Uline, uh, all carry barrels. Um, you can go ahead after, once you receive your barrel, um, determine where you want to put it and determine what type of kit is best for you. Um, you can purchase DIY kits online as well. They're kind of hard to find like in actual physical locations, but those typically run around $40. Um, the workshop that we're doing on Saturday, um, you get everything included and the teaching, the going through how to build the barrel, the painting for $50. So it's a great opportunity for you to come and learn um, and build a barrel at a discounted rate. Um, for those of you, again, who might want to tackle this on your own, um, we'll just say um, you want to make sure that if you are going to go this route, you're going to want to make sure to paint the barrel. Steve touched on this earlier. Um, if you have standing water, and sunlight that can lead to algae growth, which is not good for anyone, your plants. Um, and that brings up another point. Um, this water that you're collecting should not really be used for consumption. Um, and if you do want to use it for watering vegetables, you have to make sure that you get it tested beforehand. Uh, shingle roofs are really good at Trapping things like algae and bacteria, and they're also sometimes toxic. Um, so we don't recommend using this water for vegetables, gardens, things of that nature. Uh, the one exception might be like if you have a tin roof, um, those can be okay. But again, when in doubt, always get your water tested. A um, couple of little tips. Um, if you're installing this barrel, you want to make sure that um, the last thing you do is drill a hole in your downspout. So you want to get the barrel set up, positioned in place, elevated off the ground so that it's easy for you to install a hose. Um, and the very last thing you want to do is drill that hole in your downspout because if that's the first thing you do and things don't line up properly, um, that's kind of an expensive mistake to make. Um, another good tip is when you do drill the spigot into your barrel, you want to make sure that it's elevated off of the ground or off of the bottom of the barrel by about 30% of the barrel site. What that's going to do is it's going to help you actually keep water in the bottom of the barrel to prevent that barrel that you just made from blowing away in a windstorm and then you're out 50 bucks and have to start over again. So um, always good to make sure you leave a little bit of room in the bottom of the barrel for some water weight. Um, I think that's pretty much it on my end as far as helpful tips go. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to Sarah to finish this off. So now that you've heard all of these amazing opportunities and ways to retrofit where you live to make a difference, um, we are offering a rain barrel workshop next Saturday. So it is going to be Saturday, May 22nd from 10 to 12 p.m. It's going to be at Denigian Park. 
Um, and we have our registration link up here. I am also going to put that in the chat as soon as we're done sharing our screens. Please, 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 if you feel like this rain barrel was something really cool that you'd be interested in doing at your own home, join us. Um, also, if you're not comfortable with joining an in-person workshop, completely understandable. You can also just purchase the kit and the barrel through us. Um, cost for attendance to go to the workshop is $50. And then just to purchase the materials and review our um, virtual session that we hosted last year, that's only $35. So the link will lead you to registration. Um, and we look forward to seeing some of you all there. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer those now. I'm going to put our link to registration in the chat here. Okay, I do have a one question that says, how do I get water tested? I don't have a good place to redirect my water. No yard, just veggies in containers. What should I do with my barrel of water? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an expert on the testing matter, um, so I wouldn't be able to really give you an accurate answer. I know there are, um, you know, acceptable, um, there are um, um, organizations in Providence that do do water quality testing for a fee, um, and unfortunately, I can't give you a great answer on that right now. Um, Jake, I do know that uh, I, I just know happen to know one name. Uh, okay. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure it's local, but it's a uh, Ward Labs um, that they, you can send a send a water sample off to them, and they'll they'll, they'll test it. Okay. We yeah. also for water quality testing through the organization, we go through URI, um, and we do the Watershed yeah. Watch program. So that may be potentially a source that you could go through to test your water. I think Amelia had another option as well. <laughs> I just have another comment. So not about the water testing itself, but just for the rain barrels, um, even if you don't end up using the water um, in like for gardening or for washing your car or, you know, any other kind of practical, practical purpose, the simple act of containing the water, um, that first flush that comes onto your roof and in, in a rainstorm, as I've learned as over the years now that I'm steeped in stormwater <laughs> education for myself is that's a good thing too. So keeping the water um, that when it, during a rainstorm so that you're not, um, even if you just release all that water after the rainstorm ends, it is actually helping because you're um, preventing more water from going down into the catch basins during the rainstorm, which sort of you're, you're getting like the, sort of the dirtiest water, the, that first flush, but you're also um, stopping some water and so, it, and then it can, uh, the speed of the water is also important. So if you can like let it just kind of slowly come out of your rain barrel after a rainstorm, that actually still can have a water quality improvement because it's not rushing down the street and taking everything with it and going straight into our uh, rivers and ponds. So don't fret if you can't use the actual rain barrel water. Okay. Um I actually have a my own personal question uh, that is about if you wanted to do a bioswale on your street that um, has like a, a mound instead of a depression where you, it would be harder to get water into your property off of the roadway. Is, are there is there a method for that or that it, that just wouldn't be a good site location to to divert water off the roadway into your property if you if it has to go uphill basically. Without you'd have to dig a lot. Yeah, you'd have to dig a lot, and then it, you're basically trying to create more of a problem. That's it's it, it just becomes a tough site to do it on. We've had a couple that were mounted, um, and then just the way you have to dig and move things around, it just it turns into a site that we usually try and stay away for biosoils. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, Zach, do you want to pull up the final? poll question for everyone. Okay, as a final poll, if you guys can take that for us, that would be really helpful to help us develop uh, 
curriculum and content for future future presentations and workshops. Okay. That's probably probably good. I'm just going to share my screen one more time. Okay. All right, we got a lot of people ready to get started. That's awesome. Okay, I just wanted to share some upcoming events that we have in store at the at Roger Williams Park and the Providence Stormwater Innovation Center. Um, so coming up in, we have a lot of some fun events and some important events. And the fun event that we have, which is also important, is our Rain Harvest Arts Festival that will be on June 12th in Roger Williams Park. And that festival is a community celebration of art and green infrastructure. And so there will be artists there painting a storm drain mural. There'll be storytellers telling stories about water, musicians, a scavenger hunt to lead you around the park to green infrastructure and nature, uh, chalk available for kids to do chalk drawings, tours of green infrastructure, and then some science demonstrations as well. And then uh, every other Tuesday, starting on the 18th, uh, uh, June, May 18th, we will be teaming up with the Nature Conservancy of Rhode Island, and we will be uh, monitoring cyanobacteria in the park. And so volunteers, we're looking for volunteers to come out. And uh, this, this is a photo right here of one of our demonstrations, and uh, kids love it, adults love it. But we have uh, volunteers spread out around the park, uh, take samples of the pond water in, in Roger Williams Park, bring it back to an area right here where we have a microscope set up and we take a look at those samples and uh, uh, it helps us track sort of uh, when these cyanobacteria blooms are happening, happening in Roger Williams Park. So if you can make it to any of those events, that would be, that would be great. All right, so that's all I have. Oops. So yeah, thank you all of the presenters for taking time out on your Wednesday evening and um, all of the people that attended the attended the presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.